Avant de reprendre, je voudrais faire un merci tout spécial à Alain Paul Martin, ici du Harvard Club d'Ottawa, euh, et président de l'Institut supérieur de gestion pour sa participation aussi à l'élaboration du programme. On va continuer ce programme avec le docteur Bakary Diallo, que je vais présenter. Donc, le docteur Bakary Diallo travaille dans l'éducation depuis plus de 23 ans comme professeur, consultant, administrateur de projets, chercheur et enseignant en école secondaire, ce qui fait notre point commun. Il a rejoint en août 2005 l'université virtuelle africaine et il en a fait un acteur incontournable dans l'utilisation des technologies de l'information et de la communication en Afrique. Euh, il faut aussi souligner que c'est un ancien de l'Université d'Ottawa et, comme moi, de la faculté d'éducation juste en face. Et euh, il nous fait plaisir de l'accueillir. Je vais lui céder la parole. À vous. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm going to make my presentation in English. Uh, the reason being that at the African Virtual University um, in Nairobi, Kenya, most of my colleagues are uh, Anglophone and they helped me to do the presentation, the original presentation in, in English. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. I would like to uh, thank the organizers. And like he said, this is really, uh, Ottawa is the city uh, very close to my heart. Um, I did uh, my master's and PhD here at the, at the University of Ottawa. I work very closely with um, uh, um, uh, the colleagues who are involved in, in uh, managing e-learning and distance learning in this university. Uh, so I'm very, very glad to be here. I'm going to talk today uh, about um, the impact of MOOC on MOOCs on virtual universities, especially uh, on the African virtual university. Um, and my journey with e-learning actually started here um, some 17 years ago when I arrived at this university. And then I was taking a course, on uh, an MBA course, um, on um, e-business and e-commerce. Uh, being an educator, I'm saying, hmm, this is interesting. What would be um, the impact of ICTs in education? That's how my reflection and, and interest in, in e-learning started. Um, and since then, I think I have not stopped. And being in Africa, we see this huge opportunity that distance learning, e-learning, MOOCs, open education, uh, and open education resources uh, can, can have a great impact on e-learning. So with uh, this introductory remark, I would like to start. Don't, uh, that's it? OK. Um, my presentation would be in three main, uh, and I will have three main points. Um, overview of AVU, um, where we are in Africa, and what we do. And through that, I will tell a story of open educational resources. But before that, I'd like to start with a video just to show the impact of OER, um, material used in, on teacher education. I'm not sure if the video is ready over there. So this is a video uh, that, that was shot at the University of, of University of Nairobi, one of our partner universities in, in Africa. Right. The relationship between the uh, African Endowment Bank and the African Virtual University started about a decade ago. In 2005, we started what we call the Multinational Project One. This project involved the uh, 10 countries and 12 universities. We were able to develop, in terms of content development, 200, 219 uh, modules. We released these materials as what we call open educational resources. Um, and now they are being accessed in more than 200 countries worldwide. We have the Center for Distance Learning based here. 
and through this center, we've been able to recruit over 1,000 students. And the rate is going higher and higher and higher. We are projecting that in the next two years, we'll have more than 10,000 students doing education by distance learning. This uh, center uh, was set up as a part of uh, the African Virtual University Phase 1 of a project uh, involving uh, several partner institutions in Africa. We have now trained uh, about 120 uh, students in this program. 60 of them uh, graduated in uh, December 2013, and uh, the other 60 are expected to complete uh, next June. My name is Elkana Jugona Warukira. I'm the head teacher of Dogoto Primary School. We are about 12 kilometers from the capital city, and composition of the school is a kind of a cosmopolitan school where we have different tribes coming to run together. I did the ICT basic skills from the University of Nairobi. We have come to learn how to use technology in our teaching, also in our management of the schools. Initially, we used to do what we call the paper, paper teaching, the, t the chalkboard and the teacher centered. But the introduction of this kind of uh, system, we will be moving from the teacher centered learning to the pupil centered. When it comes to the actual teaching, we are able to explain those abstract ideas, things like volume that we could not be able to explain. With the help of the computer and drawings from the computer, we are making the learning more enjoyable and more pupil-centered. My name is Anne Nyawera Mwai. I'm a teacher here in Musagitao Primary School. It has impacted my life and my working very greatly because I am able to assess materials from the internet and uh, that material I use it to teach, especially the science and the languages nowadays. Uh, it's good to be uh, digital, <laughs> so we would really love to recommend the program to other teachers. As you know, teacher education is one of the biggest issues Africa is facing today. If you want to have um, trained the, uh, the required human resources that we need in Africa, we need to have teachers, especially in, in math and science. I think it's a program that um, should be expanded. Um, because it's an expensive program and the students tend to be quite poor. Uh, so if they are not supported for the full four years, they are likely to drop out of the program. I'm very grateful for the organization. Uh, it was not easy probably for me to raise the money to, to do the program, but having uh, funded me, I was able to go through the program very successfully without strain. And uh, this far, I am here because of the program. I'm so grateful. I recommend it to other teachers and to other people who are interested. I would like to add the African Development Bank to continue with the sponsorship to other teachers, students in Kenya and other countries in Africa so that we can be able to uplift the standards of learning, learning in our continent. I think that the work we're doing is extremely important to each of these countries and to, to the entire African continent. Uh, as we all know now, uh, we have more school leavers um, than um, um, spots in universities. And somehow, the, uni the universities are not able to accommodate all school leavers. Only 6% of school leavers in Sub-Saharan Africa are getting access to higher education. And I think that the work we're doing together uh, will definitely um, uh, assist in increasing access to higher education and to Tibet to technical and vocational education in the entire continent of Africa. Action, but it shows how um, um, the, the potential of ICTs on the continent, especially in tuition, for, tuition educate, for tuition educators. So I would like to um, uh, tell the story on how we, we, we are doing this kind of work. 
Um, as an introduction, the AVU is a uh, intergovernmental organization. It's very hard. It's, it's, the ABU is a, a intergovernmental inter organization, meaning that it's created uh, by the states. Uh, we are based in Nairobi. We operate in uh, some uh, 30 countries. Uh, 19 of these countries have signed the charter of the ABU and become a member of the ABU. We are an intergovernmental uh, organization uh, with two main offices. Uh, we have an office in, um, these are the countries that have signed our charter to give you an idea. Um, uh, of our mission and vision. We uh, operate in Francophone, Anglophone, and uh, Portuguese-speaking countries with the main focus of um, uh, increasing access to higher quality education through the use of open distance and e-learning. Um, these are um, the countries we, we cover in Africa, you can see. Um, the Francophone sites, Anglophone, Lusophone, and Arabic. Uh, it's, we have a very uh, complex uh, organization. I can see University of Ottawa is bilingual. Doing everything in two languages is highly complex. We are doing things in three languages and now moving to four. So, uh, But I, I think it's uh, working across all the countries um, and, and doing the same work is important for um, the mobility of teachers, the mobility of of, um, of graduates and, um, and, and to support the, the, the economic development of the African continent. Um, as an organization, we have three offices, two in Nairobi and uh, one in Senegal, Dakar, which is more focused on Francophone countries. Um, um, okay. Um, the context of higher uh, the, of higher education in Africa. Um, like it said in, in this video, the biggest problem we are ha having in Africa is that uh, the potential, if you look at the potential, it is the country where we have um, consistent development, um, economic development in terms of percentages. But at the same time, there is a lack of human resources. There is a lack of human capital. It's not that it's not like in Canada where we have the population aging. In Africa, we have the population is very young. But what is not there is the opportunity for them to be educated. That is a problem. And so that's why we believe that it's extremely important to look at an alternative which is open distance and e-learning and see how we can enroll open distance and e-learning um, across Africa. Uh, we know that it takes about 12 to 15% to sustain economic development, which where Africa is not there yet. Uh, mainly Sub-Saharan Africa. If you take North Africa, it's a bit different. The Maghreb is a bit different. But in terms of Sub-Saharan -Sub Africa, we have only 6% of six, uh, school leavers going to colleges, to university. So I'm just saying, again, the same story in here. Um, these are the, this table is from 2010, it's a bit um, four, four years ago, three, four years ago, of published three years ago. But this is the enrollment for on higher education colleges. If you first look at um, countries, some of them are less than close to 1% of school leavers going to university. It means that if these countries wanted to enroll all, all of their students going to university, they will have, it will take them, I don't know, um, creating universities every every month or so. So it will take them f maybe 30, 30 or 40 years to get to 12, 13%. So what we're trying to say here is that, and I was talking to, I think, one of my friends just before speaking, Africa, in my opinion, does not have a choice but to embrace open learning and this learning, distance learning. There is no other way we can award the masses in a short time to create human capital that is needed to, uh, to develop the continent. Obstacles. Uh, we do have some obstacles. Um, it's very easy to, to work from Canada, from Ottawa, from all of these countries, um, because you don't think about connection of internet. You don't think about um, um, reliable power. These things that are basic, you think that it's, you take it for granted. But it's not over there. You have to. So there are several um, 
um, obstacles that we, as a African virtual university, we 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 have to 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 find mitigation again so that we can uh, do properly descent and e-learning. So the environment is is a bit um, um, is a bit uh, challenging. Uh, but we find all the aspects that we find everywhere, like resistance to change. There was a question to the, forum, to the first speaker this morning about how to um, incentive for, for faculty. You need, they, they need to be motivated. And we, we find the same thing uh, over there. Um, the perceptions about distance learning, uh, the Canadian government, someone told us this morning, is still not um, going for open education. So all of this, I think it's, some of the challenges we find in Africa are everywhere, and, but I think mostly what is, uh, um, I think, uh, rare or what is difficult for us is in terms of infrastructure and equipment. But there are also a lot of opportunities. Um, if you look at, um, there are a lot of progress. I've been in Kenya for nine years now, and we used to have a dish satellite um, VSAT. To, to be connected to the internet. Now they have a, vi a fiber. So things are improving. And we believe that uh, because of this, it's very promising for, for distance and e-learning. Uh, the emergence of mobile technology, which means that we don't need to invest heavily in infrastructure. With mobile technology, there are a lot of things that you can do. Um, and, and to help, basically, everywhere in Africa, you can get connected to the internet through your mobile phone. So we need to know how we can translate this into opportunities for distance learning, open learning, et cetera. Um, what we do in Africa, we work primarily, our, we work with governments as intergovernmental organization. Our entry point to a country is the government, the Ministry of Education or higher education. And then we collaborate with universities across the continent. Uh, currently, we work with about 60 universities uh, across Africa. I'll talk, talk about it. Uh, programs. Uh, we do have uh, some of our programs, but most of our programs are delivered, delivered for now through the partner institutions, through the universities we, we work with. And um, uh, most of our activities right now is focused on enhancing capacity and capacity building. And some of these are some of the activities we do with, with, with the universities um, in terms of infrastructure. In, in order to mitigate the challenges we face, if you work with, for instance, the University of Nairobi, the, sh the video was shot at the University of Nairobi in Kenya. Uh, we install, we had to install a center for distance learning. You have seen the center in the video. And the center is basically uh, a physical location where you have um, um, computers, you have the internet, you have a power backup to ensure that actually there is an infrastructure in the university that work 24 hours a day, and then uh, that can support e-learning. This is important. The other uh, aspect we are working on, I will talk about it. This is open educational resources, material development. Um, this is something I will talk about it later on. Um, gender mainstreaming is important uh, for us, research and development. All of these aspects are important because the issues that you face when you do a MOOC in Ottawa is not the same that we were facing as when we are in, in, in Africa. So we have to do some kind of research to support what we are doing. How e learning model. Um, this slide is very important to us. Um, it is, if you can, yes. Basically, what we call it the consortium um, program model. This is AVU working with 60 universities in Africa to develop content that is open educational resources. This content is taught uh, di using different models, face-to-face, uh, -face, online, online, and then after that it is, uh, I don't have a laser here, I'm not sure. And af after that we put in the cloud as open educational resources, and anyone in Africa can, can benefit from it, and indeed anyone in the world can benefit from it. Um, so in 2010, we started uh, this program. As you can see, on the left, on your left, you can see all the activities we have with this country, with, with these universities. 
as you can, as you know, we all work in faculties. If you want to do anything in a faculty and you have three or four faculty members around the same table, to get them to agree is an issue. So we do that through, um, in one of the projects, we have 20 universities. We are running a current one with 27 universities. So we have to agree with faculty members from 27 universities. So it is a huge undertaking. And to do this kind of work, you have to have a strict, you have to have a very, you have to be methodical. And for instance, we have policies. Um, the first meeting we have is to agree on policies on how we do develop content, release it as open educational resources, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the second is capacity enhancement in different areas. And one of the areas of capacity enhancement is actually in, in uh, what we call professional development, helping faculty members um, to have skills to do open decent and e-learning. Um, and I remember we worked with actually the University of Ottawa in 2000, 2010 to deliver a program to some 17 universities um, in Africa. So this is part of building the capacity of our partners to do e-learning, distance and e-learning. And then curriculum design, content development, production, review, everything that you do in your faculty or in your unit, we do that with our members. And then the content is produced in different formats and then delivered um, in, uh, by ABU, by our uh, partner institutions. And like I said, then the content is available. So this is our model of developing and using OER in Africa. Uh, in 2010, we launched what we call uh, the, the ABU um, OER portal. Um, it is. Uh, you can see the portal, it is in there. Um, if you can Google it, so OER at AVU, OER at AVU, you will go to, the, to this site. And well, it was a surprise for us um, because we developed about uh, 219 textbooks in French, English, and Portuguese with 12 universities. Since it's a public money, we are funded by the African Development Bank. We said, well, why should we keep it within the 12 universities. So we decided to use uh, the creative license, the creative common license. Uh, uh, David talked about this. I don't want to be go into the specifics. So, and we make it up on educational resources. So anyone, anywhere can utilize it. And we put it on the website, just put it in there. That's what we did. But we were very surprised by um, the, the um, actually the outcome. We started seeing um, traffic from different countries, from Brazil, from the United States, from France, all of these countries, we, we were a bit amazed. Okay, what is happening in here? Um, and to date, we have 201 countries coming to decide using the materials. There are mathematics, chemistry, biology, physics, teacher education, ICT and education, that's what it is. Um, and uh, we won two prizes in, uh, based, in, um, based in the U.S. It was very competitive. We, our name was there. People have to vote. And as an African-based organization, it was, it was surprised to won in 2011 and 2012 um, for being innovative and open educational resources. What does it mean is that um, despite the challenges we're facing in Africa, we have talented faculty members that can make good things. Um, and, but what, um, well, the other side of the story is, right now we have more users outside of Africa than inside Africa. So that is a big a problem, uh, not, not really a problem, but something that we need to mitigate. Because this material, when we put it, when we put it on the website, we thought, more universities will, will, will utilize it. Uh, but it, it's just to underscore the importance of open educational resources. When it is a good resource, anywhere people would come and, and utilize it. I was in uh, Korea, um, uh, I think South Korea was three years ago, and a lady came, uh, she was from Mongolia. He, he saw that I'm African, she, she was eager to talk to me. I didn't know why, she came and said, you know, I, I found a website it's called ABU at OER or something like 
I said, okay. He said, well, you have four bachelor of education in math and sciences. And in my university in Mongolia, we were doing to do the same thing. So we assessed the material. And actually, we are utilizing it and tweaking a bit and, and utilize it. I say, yes. So I'm, I'm from the African Virtual University. She said, really? I say, yeah. So it's, we don't know how people are utilizing the thing. We don't know what the impact is in Africa and outside Africa. But for sure, I think we need a big, we need to sensitize our governments, we need to sensitize our leaders in universities, our faculty members that this is the, for us the way to go for education. So I already talked about this project. I'll just go very quickly. So what we were able to do with um, <clears throat> these open educational resources in tertiary education, for instance, in Senegal, 13,000 uh, teachers were trained or upgraded. What happened in Senegal is um, maybe 20 years ago, um, one of the and the, the donor funder decided that maybe it was not very important to have teachers super qualified. Maybe you can just hire them from high school and then send them to the classroom. So the government that time didn't have a lot of must have choices, so they implemented that policy. Um, as a result, uh, this, is for, uh, that, this was in, for primary and secondary school. As for result of 15 years and 15 years, uh, 20 years, the level of education, primary and secondary, went down completely. And uh, but it has created a social problem because you have these teachers who are not full government employees; they are paid just as contractors. Uh, about 15,000, and every year they would go on strike, say we want to be full teachers, but they don't have the qualification, and they are in the classroom everywhere. Uh, so we, with the Faculty of Education of the biggest university in Senegal, l'Université Charente Diop, we did two cohorts of 70, very small, um, as a sample, as a study across the 10 regions of Senegal to establish the methods of how we can actually reach out and, and train these people by distance and upon education. Um, so we did two court. The first court, the attrition rate was a bit high. The second was more conclusive. And uh, after that, the government come on board and starts funding the, this program using open descent and e-learning and some of the open educational resources we developed. And to, up to date, 13,000 of these teachers are now full teachers that can contribute better. And this is through open education. Uh, this is an example of Open Distance and E-Learning Center. This one was established in uh, Mozambique, those who, of you who know Africa. Mozambique is a, uh, a Portuguese-speaking country in Southern Africa, and they have a remote. Uh, this university is, is, has a lot of campuses uh, in the country. Mozambique is a huge country, and so they needed to connect some of these. So we help in um, putting in place an Open and Distance Learning Center. Uh, because of uh, the, the success of our education, open educational program, uh, what we call the, the uh, IBM Multinational Project, Pro Project One, we decided with our um, sponsor, which is the African Development Bank, to launch a new phase. That one started um, two years ago, in 2012. Uh, it is basically using the same framework, developing programs, uh, sharing programs, and, and delivering it uh, throughout network. Um, it, Apart from teacher education, we are now also doing computer science, which is very important for Africa. Um, um, and uh, another program we're developing is peace management and conflict resolution, extremely important anywhere in the world, but you know, especially also for, for Africa. And we have also, um, we are also doing what we call the ODLPD, which is the old ASAP. This is, a, um, uh, professional development for open distance and, and, and e-learning. Uh, but to do all of this, what we have learned, some of the lessons that we have learned is that as a virtual university, we, we have to have the capacity not 
to react. Like the MOOCs come and say, wow, what is MOOCs? What do we know? What do we do? But we need to have the capacity to absorb any innovation that come up. That's what we have learned. Um, and, and to do this kind of work, we have created a center that we call uh, Le Centre pour l'innovation dans l'enseignement virtuel, or Center for Virtual Education Innovation. And this center help us to translate in terms of opportunities um, the innovation that come and see how we can make Africa fully benefit from that. Uh, the center has been operational since uh, early this year, in, this, in, in January. Uh, it's focused on educational technology, learning resources. Um, we do mobile learning, mobile learning, mobile education learning, which has a huge impact for Africa. If you've been to, to Africa, any country, basically, everyone has a cell phone. It's amazing. And sometimes it's just amazing. Everyone has a cell phone. It means that they can have access to content. They can be connected to the internet. And we are looking at this potential and how we can unleash it. So that's why we have created a, uh, um, a, a laboratory for uh, mobile learning. Uh, but if you look at the number of people who have a desktop, de desktop or laptop, you'll find that there are very, very few compared to. So the center will help us, um, is helping us actually to uh, uh, spearhead our MOOC program. I'll be talking about our MOOC program in, in a moment. Uh, but also it, we found that it was important to create space for research and development on open distance and e-learning. If I need to search any topic on MOOC, on OER, when I search, mostly I find authors from all around the world, but not in Africa. So we are trying to create this space uh, by having annual conferences, and we are also launching a, a new journal on open distance and, and e-learning. This is just the Center for Virtual Education, Virtual Education Innovation that uh, uh, we have launched in Nairobi. Uh, MOOCs. And this is uh, uh, my, my, last my, my last slide. Um, I was just talking to friends before I uh, this speech, and to me, as a head of the African Virtual University, the, what is the most important in MOOCs is I'm looking at the possibility to reach out to a section of the population that otherwise would not have access to education. And that's where we would like to capitalize and see what can we do with it. So we are learning from everyone, um, have our ex, edX, um, Coursera, anyone who is doing MOOCs, we study or how, what you do and see what can we, how can we translate this in, in Africa. Um, the MOOCs have a lot of some, we did a feasibility study uh, that we conducted in 2000, end of 2013 to look at what is, a, what is the MOOC movement, what are the advantages, what are the inconveniences, and how we can utilize in Africa. The biggest problem we are facing in Africa, well, we have attrition rates, that's something, but is bandwidth. Current MOOCs are like Hollywood-type production. We don't need that. We just need good content that people can access. So which make that most of the most coming from the US cannot be accessed in Africa. So we, we have to look at another way of creating MOOCs that are accessible and that makes sense, for instance. And that's where we are trying to, to focus. Um, the other problem we're facing in Africa, or this is reality, this is not a problem, people want certification on everything they do. They want a certificate. And they want it to be transferred. And if you want to do MOOCs, it's another big challenge. But we are looking on, on, on how uh, we can address uh, these this issues. Uh, for now, we, after uh, talking to a lot of partners, and um, the, the other challenge we face uh, on doing MOOCs is the platform. Which platform to use? There are many platforms. Do you have, do you, can you create your own? Um, we 
think that we could create it our own platform and then we say maybe uh, we, can, we shouldn't be reinventing the wheel. We talked to a lot of partners. I talked to Stephanie, to Daphne, to, uh, of course, there are a lot of partners. Um, but now we're just trying, I don't know if you know about Edcast. So um, it's a startup, um, and they, they provide services. So you can rent their platform. And, but the beauty is that uh, you get all the metadata. You, you get all the So you have control over um, 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 the student uh, information and so forth. So we are trying. I think we are going to go with them. Um, and we are uh, probably uh, going to go with them and uh, launch three MOOCs, uh, one on teacher education. That's our mayor. Really, we are very strong. Um, and this program, we'll be doing it, this MOOC with the Commonwealth, Commonwealth of Learning. Uh, there is another program on peace management and conflict resolution that probably will be launching uh, early next year. And a third MOOC on uh, ODL, Open Distance and E-Learning Professional Development that we may be launching uh, around uh, May uh, of 2015. So with these uh, few words, I would like to thank you for your attention. My name is Mariam. I'm a first year um, PhD student here in education here at the Faculty of, um, Faculty of Education at the University of Ottawa. And uh, I'd like to thank you for your presentation. And I wanted to ask if you would consider a partnership with an um, international organization such as, because I work for the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, and my research is most likely going to be um, on the refugees' access to education, because on top of all the obstacles that you've listed, um, we have now security issues. I think you've heard about the girls kidnapped in, in Nigeria. That's a very serious issue. And um, sometimes it's a problem for refugees to go to school because when it's not girls, boys or men can be kidnapped and be enrolled by force by armed groups. And um, I was think I was asking myself if it would be um, possible for your your university to get some type of partnership with organizations such as UNHCR for refugees to access education online because. Um, with the humanitarian aid that we receive, only 1.4% goes to education. That's a very alarming number, and I think um, we need to find other ways. It's not just building classes in refugee camps that is going to solve the problem. So I was just wondering if you work only with governments or if you would consider working with international organizations. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, we work with international organizations. Actually, um, in one of the projects um, that I presented, the um, UNDP Somalia uh, funded uh, two Somali universities to participate in the project. So we, we have partnership uh, with international organizations in Africa and outside Africa. We collaborate with a lot of organizations. I have a lot of partners sitting around this table in here. Um, but, but sometimes the, uh, the the issue is finding the right person, the right information, and making the connections. But definitely, we we would like to do so. Anna Martin, um, I do, I want to congratulate you on your commendable achievements. And uh, with respect to the limited bandwidth, there are organizations like France Telecom who sometimes finance hot points as a hub. Uh, either in the center of a city in Africa or uh, elsewhere. And uh, you may be able to finance that kind of intervention uh, from uh, the Clinton or the Melinda Gates Foundation or others. Building on the previous question, uh, I think uh, David talked about contextualization and uh, um, Samantha talked about uh, sharing. I think also you are a model of sustainability by design. And there is uh, a potential right in this conference to collaborate. And because many of the participants really care about upgrading the level of education, not just 
here, but also in Africa and elsewhere. And because you're already multilingual, you have a multilingual base, you have an experience, and it's easy, much easier to leverage you know, your achievements and, and build on that. And one of the models we can borrow from is what Jim Kim and Dr. Paul Farmer at Harvard have done in the area of health, starting with Haiti and Rwanda, and now Partners in health, of Health is as large as uh, Médecins Sans Frontières. And so if we could borrow something from, get inspiration from that model, there may be room for building uh, a global organization built on your skills and your expertise. Thank you. All right, okay, thank you. Uh, well, I, I would like to, to learn more about that project. Um, usually we create um, project with, uh, we have a lot of stakeholders um, in Africa and outside of Africa uh, who are very interested in, in, in working with us. Uh, in Africa, for instance, we have a memorandum of understanding with the African Union Commission, which is like the equivalent of the Euro European Union Commission, um, and we, we help and advise um, and, and do some advocacy. Um, and our, around the world, also, I, I think um, we are ready to, to learn uh, from, from anyone because the needs in, in that part of the world is, is, is quite important. And when you travel, I do travel a lot because of my job in Africa. And these youth, they are so beautiful, so energetic. So they, but they, there's something lacking, this opportunity that I had when, you know, because I went to school. Um, and I think, um, um, and, and this part of the world, um, I think, you know, the world is now a global village. It's not anymore, you can say, I mean, Ottawa at this I live in Nigeria. We, it's this is a very small world because of ICTs. Because of it's very easy to move from one place to one. We need to think about global citizenship, and we all need to be concerned to make sure that people anywhere in the world are well educated, because we are all neighbors. Excusez-moi, je vais peut-être poser ma question en français cette ouais. fois-ci. C'est un petit peu plus complexe. Ouais. Euh, la question euh, venant à propos de, des camps de réfugiés euh, me touche parce qu'il y a déjà quelques années, on, a, on avait développé un, un enseignement à distance pour les camps de réfugiés en droit. Et euh, ça a très bien fonctionné, mais c'était une initiative très limitée en français euh, pour les camps de réfugiés en Tanzanie. Et ce ce que j'ai retenu de cette expérience, c'est que nous avions réellement besoin de construire cette solution avec les personnes sur place. Et donc, je me demande si la solution d'Open Resource, comme vous l'avez présentée, s'il n'y a pas quelques contradictions avec justement une approche qui serait une approche programme, j'ai bien aimé l'idée des MOOPS, et qui tienne compte non seulement de l'offre, mais aussi des contextes et des environnements très particuliers, insécures, avec des faibles sources technologiques, etc., et besoin aussi de tutorat sur place. Comment, comment on pourrait arriver à ce genre de solution Je pense que ça nous obligerait à, à penser pas seulement aux ressources, aux offres de programmes, mais aussi aux environnements dans lesquels les personnes vivent et sont tellement différents. Ok. Uh, merci bien pour votre question. Um, donc, pour nous, uh, travailler avec les réfugiés uh, qui sont un groupe assez important quand même en, en Afrique, parce qu'il y a des conflits qui, um, très souvent, malheureusement, um, et les, les gens sont déplacés. Uh, par exemple, en Somalie, nous avons formé 4000 personnes en Somalie. Vous savez que la Somalie, c'est un pays qui est en conflit, qui n'a pas de gouvernement. Euh, euh, en partenariat avec quelques universités dans le monde et en partenariat avec euh, euh, UNDP Somalia, nous avons euh, pu former des personnes en IT, en journalisme. Et un des journalistes que nous avons formé a, a, a même travaillé pour la BBC, la radio de la BBC. La, la radio BBC. Euh, je pense qu'il euh, y a un énorme potentiel de faire ces choses-là. 
Mais encore, comme je l'ai dit, c'est un peu difficile pour, pour former les partenariats parce que la plupart des gens qui travaillent dans, pour les Nations Unies peut-être ne comprennent pas c est, c est ce que nous faisons en éducation en distance. Mais comme vous l'avez dit, euh, les MOOCs, pour moi, en Afrique, parce que les MOOCs, c'est des cours, c'est des, des cours. On ne peut pas former euh, en quantité, en qualité, en Afrique, pour nos besoins, en offrant seulement des cours. Nous avons besoin de programmes. C'est pourquoi j'ai parlé, parlé de MOOCs. Et euh, pour nous, euh, nous, nous sommes déjà établis dans plusieurs pays. Donc, il va falloir qu'on établisse euh, un système euh, d'accréditation de, 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 à travers plusieurs pays. Nous avons commencé cela pour que quand on donne un cours, le même cours, que ce cours-là soit reconnu dans plusieurs pays en, en, en même temps. Et nous aussi devons travailler sur le, le, le transfert des crédits. Euh, au Canada, vous, vous le faites d'une université à, à l'autre. Nous, nous devons le faire d'une université à l'autre dans un pays et d'une université à l'autre à, à travers les pays. Donc c'est un, un système assez complexe, euh, mais nous pensons que c'est très important de mettre les mécanismes en place. En mai euh, de cette année, de 2013, nous avons euh, eu une réunion en Nairobi. Euh, au Canada, vous n'avez pas euh, ce qu'on appelle un conseil national pour la qualité assurance. Ce n'est bon, pas des conseils, mais c'est des autorités en fait. C'est eux qui accréditent les universités. Ici, je pense que c'est l'AUCC au Canada, c'est l'AUCC qui coordonne un peu ça. Mais dans la plupart des pays africains, et même aux États-Unis, on a une autorité. En France, je ne sais pas si vous avez cette autorité. Donc, qui dit que cette université, on la met sur la liste des universités qui sont reconnues, et qui peuvent donc, euh, et, et, et aussi, ils, ils, ils approuvent les programmes cette autorité. Donc nous avons euh, rencontré, nous avons mis ensemble euh, 21 de ces autorités à travers l'Afrique pour trouver une solution d'une accréditation de nos programmes à travers les universités, à travers les pays. Et euh, l'idée des MOOCs est, est très, pour nous, est, est très importante et c'est quelque chose, euh, c'est un programme ou bien une voie que nous voulons suivre euh, pour les réfugiés, mais aussi vous savez, comme je l'ai dit, euh, ce qu'on appelle le secteur informel en Afrique, c'est là où il y a le plus de personnes qui travaillent. Et la plupart des personnes qui sont dans le secteur informel ont soit fini l'éducation primaire ou bien fini l'éducation secondaire ou ont été à l'université. Mais la plupart, c'est à, à, à partir de l'université, de l'éducation, de l'école primaire et secondaire. Mais cette masse... C'est des, des millions et des millions de jeunes qui ont besoin de, 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 de formation euh, dans, des, dans des domaines très variés. Et, et je pense que euh, l'idée des MOOCs, de ces programmes-là, peut, peut, peut les aider à prendre à, une sélection de cours pour avoir une qualification dans un, dans un métier ou bien dans un autre. Donc c'est une idée que nous voulons bien poursuivre. Mais euh, nous ne pouvons pas euh, faire cela tout seul. Nous avons besoin de partenaires euh, en Afrique et en dehors de l'Afrique pour le faire. Je vous remercie. Thank you for a very inspiring presentation and answers to the questions so far. I was just wondering if ever as a public service, you might use the AVU to broadcast uh, real-time urgent information. There's a new kind of refugee right now in Western Africa. It's orphan children whose parents have died of Ebola. And as I read the press accounts, Ebola, uh, new, the new cases are doubling every two to three weeks and currently out of control. And this, despite the international community coming to it, they're still chasing an accelerating snowball going down a hill. And I think this, the space is not lessening yet. And so there's a lot of misinformation in Western Africa about what to do, and especially since about 80% of those who have the symptoms are denied access to uh, whatever care facilities there are, and some of these care facilities don't really provide much. There are existence proofs and there are best practices. There are a couple of countries who have stopped it in its tracks. Um, and I read two days ago 
of a, of a woman, who, a young woman, whose father was denied access to three separate places that he, she took him to because he had these symptoms. And uh, she was training to be a nurse, and she had a mother and two siblings, and figured out if, if I'm gonna save my family, it's gonna be me. And it's an existence proof, it's it written up in the New York Times, and she used very inexpensive stuff like wrapped herself in garbage bags and, and rubber boots and all kinds of other things, very inexpensive. The father died, but she saved the other three people in her, in her, in her, uh, in her household. So I'm just thinking, in an emergency situation like this, would, uh, would the ABU ever think about putting together kind of a crisis unit to put together the best information we have right now and educate the population on this. I mean, there are other things like uh, sanitation practices and, and burial practices, which are exacerbating the problem. If that information could get out to the population because the healthcare workers are not sufficient to, to do anything, uh, that could have a major impact, I would think, on the Ebola crisis. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you. My name, my name is Dick Larson. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Dick. Dick is a very uh, has a very innovative brain. Anytime I meet him, he comes with some ideas. But this is great, and I, I think I have not had no thought about it. But I think it's something that is uh, not uh, not only um, desirable, but I think it's it's, it's a very useful uh, to put these kind of things together. Um, so I I will send an email to my team after this meeting. <laughs> So we we'll see uh, if there is something that we can do about it. Uh, there are a lot of players now um, um, we, uh, surround Ebola. Um, a lot of players, people are are, are working on it. But I, I think on, on the educational side, I have not seen any course or any kind of materials, educational materials. Um, so and I think it could be a great idea. Um, so I will I will look into it, and you'll be copied on everything so that. Yeah. We, can, we can still learn from you. And uh, Martin, I just want to mention, this is a perfect idea to be financed by Partners in Health. And uh, I have no doubt, uh, Dr. Paul Farmer, as well as Partners in Health Canada, which I contribute to create, would actually be prepared to work with your university to finance crisis right. kind of education system. Great. So, Thank so, you. Une idée est née. Bon, on verra bien. Okay, merci bien. Thank you very much.